Austin did not tell me that it's going to be such an interesting, diverse, wonderful group. I'm usually in hostile situations everywhere I go in my life. And I come in here and it's such an interesting, cool group. I'm like, uh, uh, I need to move to D.C. and join this group. And I'm just sitting here watching. I want to stay for the whole thing. So uh, thank you uh, for having me, Austin. I'm going to jump right in for the sake of time. Is everybody familiar with the concept of harm reduction with substance abuse or in general harm reduction? And if you're not, that's okay. And I'll ask questions, but I just kind of want to get a sense of the audience that I'm dealing with because I don't want anyone to get confused. And I think it's sort of ubiquitous out there in the vernacular of the culture to some extent in the U.S. nowadays where it hasn't been before. Um, so I think there's some familiarity with it, and I'll get started on it. I'll get started right away on it. So the first two things I have up there are definitions I got from uh, organizations, uh, health organizations, uh, government organizations, and I want you to, uh, they're actually sort of wrong. Uh, if we just read the uh, first one, policies, programs, projects, that aim primarily to reduce the health, social, economic harms associated with the use of psychoactive substances. Uh, it's not wrong, but, uh, uh, and the second one is uh, about the same thing. Uh, it doesn't capture all of what arm reduction really is. I like my definition, the third one down, and there's a couple of important things in there. And just so, if anyone's really off-bearing, Narcan, they call that as sort of the epitome of uh, uh, arm reduction nowadays. Everyone should carry a, some Narcan with them just in case someone overdoses. For me, the better definition is attitudes, policies, social and clinical programs. And that's key, social and clinical programs. And I use the term social intentionally because I want to leave it broad attitudes very broad concept attitudes policies social and clinical programs that aim to reduce the impact of unhealthy behavior on the individual and society at large notice it doesn't have psychoactive substances in there because it's really much broader than that okay uh, it's for any unhealthy behavior which we want to mitigate or reduce, but we're having a difficult time with. So these working definitions that they have, they uh, really do address both the legal and illegal consequences of substance abuse. And I want to note something here and... Uh, uh, it's really critical when we talk about harm reduction, when someone really thinks about the sort of 30,000 foot view of harm reduction, legal retribution is not a response to a behavioral problem. And I use the term behavioral problem in the broadest sense of the word. In this case, I'm going to consider the disease model of addiction. Okay. And it's important to note, which really there's a lot of reactions and people in the case of substance abuse the aim of a harm reduction program is not necessarily to decrease the drug consumption of that individual but it does not include exclude it because in the long run collectively both on the individual and the greater society at large or that cohort suffering from the substance abuse you want to stop the use the abuse, and all of the harms it does. In spirit, in the most theoretical way to describe it, and I'm going to get into this uh, towards the end, harm reduction is about maximizing overall utility in a society, okay? And it's very different than somebody spending on one individual $30,000, dollars $60,000, and wow, look, you know, he was a serious addict, and now he has his life back. We, we want to affect as many lives as we can in the most positive way, considering our social resources. And one other factor, which I'm going to get to towards the end of this talk, and uh, that is the fact that we are, after all, 
human beings, every single one of us. And that's critical. By the way, that, the title of this talk was uh, Harm Reduction in America, Can It Work? And because most people are assuming it can work and it's not working. So I didn't uh, get into that, but uh, here we are with this. Okay, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, it's not a new concept. Uh, for most of us in this audience, except the uh, France from Germany is way too young, but for most of us, we saw the first sort of glimpse of what harm reduction is, especially on the West Coast, uh, to some extent in New York on the East Coast, with the spread of AIDS, HIV, and, and what we did with needle exchange programs, it really drastically impacted the spread of HIV and AIDS, right? Uh, because um, it wasn't just through uh, sexually transmitted, but you know, you're using dirty needles. That same population was very much involved in sharing needles, and we saw a large impact, okay, in the spread and the sort of dissemination of an infectious disease. A lot of us, that was sort of our uh, first um, exposure to it, if you will. But this stuff goes back, you know, you can go back and in ancient China. Uh, one of the um, uh, cities, one of the provinces actually had a serious problem. The men would go into, uh, all year round, but especially in the winter, they would go to the local tavern and they would get heavily intoxicated, inebriated. And on the walk back to the village, there was a bank, ice, and a river. And so many of them would slip down and die or freeze to death. And it was a problem because productivity became a real problem in that province. And so uh, they tried many uh, ways to, uh, uh, sh you know, stop the drinking. They couldn't do it. And so they built a barrier where these guys were walking along the bank of the uh, river. And uh, so they couldn't slip and fall down. That is a beautiful example of harm reduction. They got to go home. They got to sober up. They hit the field the next day and they were there for their families. So this is a very old concept. Uh, we saw it, and many people, this is what's uh, strange about us here in the United States. Uh, we do have things like medication-assisted treatment, and this is basically using a controlled substance to curb your appetite for heroin, fentanyl, or whatever it may be. And we have great products. We've had them for many, many years, methadone long before. And uh, so, you know, it's replacing heroin and opiates with a medication that you can control and eventually cut back on and give the addict their life back. Many people don't know at the turn of the century in the 1900s, we had morphine maintenance clinics, okay? And the, uh, believe it or not, I mean, you can read the historical records. We did not look at addiction and addicts with the same stigmatized, uh, criminalized uh, eye that we have now. Uh, there was thousands of committed doctors replacing addiction with morphine at that time. And it was working. Other places you've seen it in the 20th century, in the 60s in Europe. Uh, and this is kind of a funny thing. There was a lot of car accidents because of uh, intoxication. They introduced seatbelts. And what was interesting at that time was the people that were opposing it were trying to say, look, these accidents are occurring because of reckless driving, okay? What do you mean? They didn't even want the language of saying, you know what? These guys are going to drink. We're having a hard time controlling it. Let's introduce seatbelts, okay? And then in the 70s, alcohol policy research, uh, researchers, uh, World Health Organizations, they really uh, uh, honed in that, on this idea, make the world a safer place. And uh, as we discussed Response to the AIDS crisis uh, was what we saw here in the late 80s, early 90s. Okay, so it's been around and it's been proven in multiple countries over time with good evidence-based medicine and research that it works at, at, at many levels. Some of the misconception, misconceptions that we have here, misconceptions uh, that we have here, you know, uh, harm reduction and abstinence are mutually exclusive. And so if you institute harm reduction uh, uh, methods, you're not going to get somebody sober or get them off of that drug, okay? False. Absolutely not uh, exclusive. Uh, uh, and I can 
answer you if you have any questions about, well, how is that the case? Um, harm, re harm reduction rejects the role of law enforcement. Wrong. Harm reduction needs law enforcement to make all of the programs successful and society's attitude to improve and embrace harm reduction efforts. Another misconception, it encourages uh, drug use. Again, wrong. It is what it is. And things like this don't have a value of good or bad unless we put them on it. And it all depends on the lens and the paradigm that we approach the situation and look at both those suffering from substance abuse and how we as a society want to approach them. Uh, and it certainly is not a form of moral failure. Uh, a lot of these thoughts come from, uh, again, I have nothing against AA, 12-step programs. They're wonderful. They do what they do. But certainly, uh, as in every other area, and, uh, a lot of the 12-step philosophies have been sort of perverted as they have come up through the years by individuals and people that think they may be doing right and they're not doing right. It is not a moral failure. It is something that fits into the disease model, both at a public health level and at a clinical engagement level. And you can utilize these sort of uh, technologies, if you will, the tools of harm reduction to get individuals healthy with a wide impact on society for very cheap. I can say I don't know a single country that has ever started a harm reduction program and uh, has reversed it or didn't see the effects in a positive way, except us here in the United States. Well, I already discussed some of these. You know, harm reduction includes education, needle exchange, drug treatment programs, and very importantly, community development support network for the drug users. That's the hardest part. And that's where I'm going to point out that we may be failing. And again, methadone clinics, buprenorphine, which I consider the new methadone, uh, these are really sort of uh, should be landmark and stable components of a true harm reduction program within a social framework, okay? Uh, the key here, and again, I'll come back to this, these programs at every level, the only way they're going to work is to community and so society's acceptance and involvement, okay? It's not going to work without those. And I'm going to come back to this towards the end, and I'm watching my time, uh, Austin, and sort of uh, really hone in on that and stress that point, okay? And these programs, they have to be very flexible. Uh, it has to have a low threshold, low intensity, uh, uh, to high threshold, high intensity, and multiple points of entry. Uh, and what do I mean by that, Dan? You know, they, they have to be flexible. If you take, I always used to, in the years past, I used to use this example. If you take, let's say, a transgender, HIV positive, heroin addict that's also a prostitute in New York City, and you tell him you have to be there at 10 a.m. at the clinic to get your methadone, your Suboxone, whatever the issue is. You can't expect that person with all of the complexities of their life that our society doesn't support and accept, and many of which are illegal, in addition to his need for the substance, you can't expect a regular engagement on time every day. And when that happens, you have to allow and be forgiving and non-judgmental and not lose the patient. I point this out because this kind of attitude, whether it's at the individual level or the system, the institutions, and society at large, is the only way we're going to get a handle on substance abuse in the United States. And what I'm describing there is at the clinic level. And we can't even get that. Just some examples of uh, what needle exchange really is, uh, what uh, so, what harm reduction re really is, the many forms it can take. Um, 
uh, a lot of studies have shown it not only for the slowing down the spread of HIV, but we can look at the studies of methadone and the impacts it's had on cities all the way going back to the 70s in Europe. And uh, the results are astounding. Nowadays, people tout like sort of, let's say, the Portugal model of tre uh, treating substance abuse. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't remember the number, but in the 90s, uh, you know, their overdose deaths were in the thousands with thousands incarcerated. And a few years ago, I looked at their overdose death. And for that year, it was like three. And, and uh, that is a, a you know, very nice implementation at every level of society for harm reduction. And uh, you can see, and it's important to, to really consider the economic benefits of these things. Unfortunately, resource utilization, we have an issue with nowadays. But let's look at a little bit of, at the history of substance abuse, at, at least from the 20th century on in the U.S. and how it evolved. How, how, why are these people stigmatized? Uh, uh, why are they, uh, why is there such an engagement and uh, enmeshment with law enforcement and the legal system? Um, uh, uh, and if you look back, you know, uh, it really had quite a bit to do with the Harrison Drug Act of 1914 and the seeds of the Drug Enforcement Agency by um, Harry Anslinger or some, I, I, I think I was the first sort of that head honcho of this stuff, but it really goes back to the uh, 20s and, uh, and the 30s. Uh, initially, the addict had uh, uh, full access to doctors. And as I said, a lot of morphine clinics were ran for these folks. And they went about their lives. They, they truly maintained their jobs. They maintained their family relationships. You could not tell. And uh, over time, there was quite a bit of success in getting them off the drug, but nevertheless, they maintained their health at the individual level, at their immediate social level, and obviously, greater society at large. But once the Harrison Drug Act came in and a lot of enforcement started to occur, and you started to see this in the 20s and 30s, I always like to refer to Billie Holiday. If anyone's ever really interested and the uh, uh, impact of the DEA coming in and changing our public attitude towards uh, addiction uh, and how it's some, in, in many ways, it became a race war, a class war. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to take a look at Billy Holiday's life. But they went after doctors initially, and thousands of doctors went to jail, okay, for keeping these clinics open. And the sort of propaganda machinery that started to churn out in shaping the public view of the addict was what's really one of fear, misinformation, uh, racism, uh, uh, issues about class, socioeconomics, and it was really all propaganda. And I can say this without any political bias. Why? Because it was, and you can read through the literature, and that's what it was, okay? To this day, we feel the effects of it because we've never as a society bounced back from the initial stigma and the initial caricature of the drug addict. And it, again, it was really, to me, when I look at it, it's clear it was one of... Uh, uh, it had to do with race, and it had to do with socioeconomics, and it was targeting groups. But nevertheless, it ended up affecting so many lives, and the repercussions we're feeling today, okay? I want to point to uh, a study, and this is for your edification, and you can really think about this in terms of harm reduction. Uh, 80s, as you all remember, was the co cocaine crisis here. Rand and the uh, U.S. Army, I believe it was, it's about 94 pages, this study, it had four arms. Uh, it was by Rand Corporation and the U.S. Army. And the four arms, the two extreme ends of the groups, it was a very well-designed study. I uh, showed, uh, the question they posed was, what is the cheapest and most effective way to reduce the impact of cocaine in this country? And the answer was clear, right? 
uh, the cheapest uh, way was, uh, you know, uh, uh, prevention, education, treatment, okay? That was the best way to, and the cheapest way to reduce the impact um, of cocaine in the United States of America. The least effective and most expensive was incarceration, law enforcement, uh, and crop decimation. Incidentally, not long after that, when we went to sort of the war on drugs in Colombia, uh, and uh, you know they went to town on uh, burning all those fields, you had the largest displacement of poor and indigenous populations outside of the Middle East, Egypt, was in Colombia, because those people lost all of their livelihood, and to this day, the larger cities in, in Colombia still feel the effects. In our case, incarceration in America, okay? Uh, that's the graph. That's how it went up. And, and uh, if you look at it, it really, uh, it's a history of prohibition, class wars, and uh, really war on drugs is what it's called, but it's a slogan, okay? So I've given you a little bit of what harm reduction is in, in a practical way. I've given you a little bit of the history and I can now want to give you the real meat of what harm reduction is, okay? The philosophical approach, whatever you're doing in healthcare, whatever you're doing in mental health, everything should be harm reduction because here's what it is. It's respecting the autonomy, the choice, and the freedom of the individual in how they live and coming up with practical situation, uh, solutions to minimize the impact of what is going on and what we think is free will. And it could be argued. Autonomy, okay? You have individualism, uh, humane approach. And through that, uh, and here's another one, uh, keeping them accountable without terminating or judging them and meeting them where at. And through that, believe it or not, when you do the statistics, when you look at the mass effect, you will achieve sobriety and a better quality of life for that individual, both at the physical body level, in medicine we call it morbidity and mortality, disease and death, and the individuals around them, hence greater society at large, and the cost of society. But they're saying it's not working. And you will see little pockets of harm reduction in the U.S., needle exchange programs in some cities. Um, all the workers in the field of substance abuse talk about harm reduction. And uh, I was sort of taken back. I'm actually, I live in Orange County, Southern California. I am from the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I embrace our sort of sense of social justice and uh, equality. That's what I grew up in. That's what I came up in. I went to Berkeley. I believe in those things. And I think they were. And I was shocked recently. The mayor of San Francisco was declaring harm reduction is not working. And she actually, I was shocked, advocated harsher prosecution and enforcement policies. Meanwhile, the DA <laughs> was saying, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And this was shocking to me because it really shows our memory as a society, our, our ability to retain meaningful formal information versus being reactionary to fear and media. When you're talking about harsher prosecution and enforcement policies, you're talking about jailing and arresting homeless people off the streets. It didn't work. We incarcerated all of those people. It didn't do anything. The only thing it did is we have a culture of, hey, it's cool to go to prison. You can't have such a large portion of your population that has had served severe time in prison, put them back out in society with any resources and expect things to get better. And here you are in the 21st century as the mayor of San Francisco declaring that we need to go to partial prosecution and enforcement policies. And the, it begs the question, helmets, they're harm reduction. Seatbelts, they're harm reduction. Why is substance abuse not working? 
people nowadays talk about the fentanyl crisis. Hey, hey, look, we've been in the opiate crisis for years. We, they, they were talking about that. Let, let's let's get this thing solved back way before 2010. In 2010, there was 21,000 deaths. In 2021, over 100,000. What's going on to the extent that harm reduction may not be working? And I argue that the issue of having a needle exchange program, if you can, by the way, I was the first physician in the history of Orange County to sponsor and run a needle exchange program. And uh, it's a good thing I didn't get shot, but I did get shot shut down and uh, we couldn't serve anybody and they went after me the city and uh, all of that stuff which is an interesting story but uh why aren't these things not working and uh, uh i argue because is is uh, it, it would be something like this imagine if you have a w whole bunch of indd formula cars and these are the countries let's say in europe and i'm not saying europe is better or not but i'm just using that and we have this super uh, hyper boost fuel. And someone says, look, this fuel will make you go faster and you will win the race. And they all try it and they go faster and, you know, each one wins a race. But the fuel isn't going to work and make a junk car with crappy wheels win the race. Because the problems that we have are systematic, social and we need to change complete social attitudes and get everybody in the community and in our society engaged, involved, and truly have a humane, compassionate approach to treating these patients and applying harm reduction. I'm going to leave it at that and uh, i hope you got something out of it uh austin i hope i finished in time i always get worked up on this and um i i think you said if there's any questions someone asked they're more than welcome to um and that's it thank you very much for the time dr b thank you uh that was that was a fantastic uh um brief introduction to, to harm reduction I, I know you can uh talk about that uh for hours uh <laughs> at a, at a time. So it, it was a, it was a wonderful overview and, uh, it, you know, for everybody that's never been to, um, a rotary international conference, um, uh, I highly recommend that you go. And, and, and while the, the current, um, uh, uh, priority, um, of rotary is, is to end polio and completely eradicate polio. Uh, there's been quite a lot of talks um, about addiction recovery and harm reduction at the RI uh, level. At, uh, when I went to the Houston conference, there was uh, some uh, incredible uh, conversations with high-level doctors uh, in the country that are leading harm reduction um, uh, programs or trying to uh, at the Rotary level. And so that's why I wanted to bring Dr. B on uh, to speak to all of us about this. And I think it was fantastic. Um, I want to open it up to questions uh, to everybody. I'm going to kind of kick things off here. Uh, Dr. B, you, you had you had mentioned that no country that has implemented a robust harm reduction program has regretted it or reversed it. Uh, what country, uh, and you kind of mentioned Portugal, but what, what country do you think is, is leading the way in arm reduction and, and what are they doing and how is it working? You know, it, it depends because uh, uh, the issue of substance abuse is different in a lot of the European countries. France is here and uh, he can check me, but I'll use Germany a little bit, right? Uh, they have a, a very strong uh, healthcare system. And although uh, opiates haven't taken hold there in the same way they have here, Alcohol has always been an issue in in that country. And uh, uh, through the medical practices, uh, number one, no one's uh, really judged in the same way or stigmatized when there is a problem, right? But the healthcare system, that's uh, who is just as important. They provide many tools, resources, including education, recovery pro programs, and so forth, uh, that really embrace, and in fact, in some ways, Germany itself, even though I'm only talking about alcohol, is quite a leader in harm reduction when you look at the details, nooks and crannies. 
Portugal, obviously, right? You know, their 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 approach uh, is uh, you don't go to court, and you don't. In fact, I, I my, my own personal view is the whole legal system needs to be revamped and updated here in the U.S. But then, when you go for a substance uh, issue, and unless if it's major trafficking, right? The case is reviewed by a team and a council of the therapists, social workers, doctors, uh, housing folks. And uh, you see some of this in Spain and a few other countries as well. And you've never really seen it reversed anywhere. In fact, it's expanded upon. Uh, uh, and so, you know, we can use, uh, like I said, Germany, I think is a wonderful example, even though Franz might say, hey, no, our healthcare system isn't great. The grass is always green on the other side. Some people do that. Canadians do that. Another one is ca uh, Canada, right? In some of the places where they instituted, uh, you can call them shooting galleries, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, and I forgot the name. There's a lot of data and studies on this. But they were having major overdose deaths, and they funded and instituted uh, places where an addict can go and use their drugs. You know, you can say that nowadays. A few years ago, if I said something like that, it would be blasphemy in the U.S. But they essentially, in those areas where they instituted these, they reduced overdoses to zero. But the nice thing when you have things like that, and if you have community involvement, you can have all the needle exchange you want. And you can even take that extra wonderful step and having a safe place that's monitored or a person can shoot up. But the real key is community support, involvement, and dollars going in to deal with the person's housing, to deal with the person's legal issues, to deal with the issues that come with substance abuse, uh, mental health, anxiety, depression, uh, personality disorders, uh, access one disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders. So all of those countries in the areas that you see this implemented, there has been an impact of reducing the harm. For for uh, thank you for that, Doctor B. For time's sake, let's let's do uh, two more questions. Arnold uh, came up first. Uh, Arnold, if you want to jump in, you know, uh, thank you, thank you, Doctor B, for uh, sharing a small portion of your presentation work for us. Um, I'm formerly the co-chair of the Drug and Alcohol uh, Outreach Committee at my church, and I've tried to be educated. And my, I wonder if you would comment briefly on the increased uh, use of cannabis, the legalization of cannabis, and on the flip side, substances like peyote. Okay, substances like peyote, is that what you said? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much for the question. And uh, uh, so on the cannabis, I will be brief, okay? Uh, we will fill, the, again, in the uh, America, we take things and one, it becomes a marketing issue and now it's a and, uh, cure for everything. And that's a population, including the Kratom population, that are very cultish in protecting their turf. Maybe there's a lot of money involved. Maybe the users, the ones that have been using for a long time. We will see the effects of cannabis the commercialized cannabis, and we are seeing the effects of it in many ways. If you asked me 20 years ago about cannabis, I'd be like, uh, you know, we'd be like, and you started to come at me and criticize it, I would say, you know, that's a political position. Cannabis has no harm, even though the stuff is 100 times stronger than six, the 60s. Today, I'm going to tell you, the way this stuff is put together, synthesized, manufactured, used, uh, and genetically grown, this stuff causes psychosis. This stuff causes addiction. People are legitimately going into rehab for cannabis, and the data has to be discerned, and we have a lot to learn. Nevertheless, I promise you, you are, and you will see the impact of the current cannabis use and the attitudes towards it, again, it's kind of silly. You know, you could talk about alcohol, it's legal. So what is legal? It's the most harmful substance on the planet after tobacco. Okay, it doesn't matter if you market it. Cannabis, same thing. You see this sort of lax attitude with some parents towards it. So the, the short uh, answer is it's not good and we're going to see the impact. Peyote, I, I will say this. I'll be really quick. 
I absolutely categorically know and believe that there is extensive therapeutic potential and psychoactive drugs to, for treatment of many, 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 many things. Nevertheless, uh, the research has to be done. We have to get there. We have to formalize it. And it has to be disseminated, practiced, instituted in some sort of a thoughtful manner, but not put into the market of the free market economy. And that's my thoughts on peyote. Kristen, would you like to jump in? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. And thanks, uh, uh, you know, uh, Austin for bringing this to us. Um, so, you know, the way I'm seeing it is you've got a broken healthcare system, from my opinion, in the United States, not to mention just the system, where we don't, we don't prioritize money toward what you've talked about already. And there is that deep-seated cultural attitude of boot, bootstraps, you're a waste on society if you're not efficient and effective and productive. And um, and so to me, when I hear the San Francisco story, it's sort of that. It's like we tried, but we didn't change our culture enough. And it kind of comes back to we don't want to see people around us who are sad and depressed and you know sick and all those things. So, so, um, so how do you, I mean, I think the cultural part is the much harder part. And if we don't have a healthcare system that already supports those people, we will be encountering, you know, struggling, hurting people. And I think it's hard for us to kind of do that with our culture the way it is. So, so help me understand how you think culture could change when all these other systems are also not really supporting the product. Two points out. You said healthcare system. For something to be a system, there has to be a systematic, uh, evidence-based approach to an end goal that benefits everybody. We don't have that kind of thing in our healthcare. I refuse to call our system a system. It's a uh, grab your money uh, for all. We don't have a healthcare system. I'm not going to blame anybody. It's top to bottom. It's insanity. Okay, outcomes are horrible for the ultra rich. And for the ultra poor, for different reasons. If you're a Hispanic, African American, very poor, or if you're ultra rich, you're screwed. Okay, you are not going to get the best care for different reasons. So let me relieve you of that tension with the healthcare system. The other part of what you said, I'm going to tell you, I never claim to have solutions for greater society. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I maybe if we uh, uh, at 53. And uh, uh, given where my life is, at some point I uh, stopped fighting and uh, started to finally look at self preservations I looked at all my buddies and they're all rich. And I'm like, you know, I got a small child. I got to think of myself. I carved out my own piece of reality, right? I have a medical office, which you won't find, that is categorically committed to substance abuse and anything else you fail at, mental health folks and so forth. And for some reason, it has prospered, grown. So I exercise and practice everything I preach within my small reality. And uh, I get the outcomes I want. Uh, greater society, I don't have an answer. I, you know, maybe we need to hurt enough. Maybe uh, we need to hit rock bottom of this as a society to understand that, look, this is a small planet and we're sucking everything dry. At some point, we have to turn our narcissistic traits into consideration for our offsprings, right? I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. That's the best I can tell you. I do think that if I can get one individual to change their mind, another individual to change their mind, maybe at that grassroots social conscious level, we can start making an impact, but I don't know. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. B. Uh, as we wind down here, um, if anybody has any questions that uh, that you didn't have a chance to ask for time's sake, I want to respect everybody's time. Let me know. Reach out to me. I'm happy to connect you with Dr. B. And we, I'm sure he's uh, happy to answer any more specific questions for you that you have. Um, I want to open up uh, happy bucks here uh, as we wind down. Um, happy dollars are things that we're, that we're happy for, that we want to celebrate, show our appreciation for. I'm going to start it off, uh, and it's completely, um, um, optional, of course. Uh, I'm going to start it off with, uh, with $15. Um, 
I'm really excited uh, for for Luke uh, to become a citizen today. So congratulations on on that, Luke. That is absolutely massive. Uh, my wife had uh, surgery today. That went very successful. She's downstairs resting. And thank you so much, Doctor B, uh, for speaking to us and, and sharing wisdom. Uh, thank on- you, guys. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't. I, I I appreciate you having me here. Thank you for giving me the privilege to speak to you guys. And I deeply apologize. I do have a meeting. I got to run to. So I'm going to excuse myself. If you have any questions, reach out to Austin. Thank you again for having me. Uh, It was an honor.